Eileen and Victoria here. And um, yeah, that was what I was kind of waiting for whether we were gonna do the recording. So all right, got it, perfect. All right, so I guess what we can do here now is dive into these intros. If my computer will cooperate with me, I'm doing a little bit of filibustering right now because even over here, it's not necessarily pulling up. Give me one moment and then we're gonna get this get this going and then I'm gonna share my screen. But first off, thank you all for coming here again for another Thursday night. This one's gonna be really cool. We get into the basics of how a bill becomes a law, how an idea even gets close to becoming put into legislation and drafted. And we have the awesome Jamie Lynn Wheeler and we have Victoria and Kylie. And you wanna go ahead and just introduce yourselves on my Laptop is attempting to, to, to boot up here. Yes, we do. And that's okay. We are going to do the introduction anyways without the slide. So um, hi, everybody. My name is Jamie Lynn. You can call me Jamie. Um, I am the advocacy director at Common Power. And this is a really special opportunity to be here with you all tonight because we are just getting our department off the ground and building it out. Kylie, Victoria, and myself. And so it's really fun to be able to talk a little bit about the basics and 101s of what advocacy and uh, legislation is and means um, and how we advocate for it out in the world. So we're looking forward to this third and final Miss Disinfo session to go a little bit in the weeds on that and hopefully uh, answer any questions you may have and um, teach you something that, that perhaps you don't yet no, um, but if you do know all the answers to our questions, make sure to engage in the chat. Um, and really the pie in the sky thing that we want to achieve at the advocacy department here at CP is voting justice and voting access for all. We live in the United States of America, we have a democracy, um, several of us, a lot of us vote probably on this call, um, but it is really hard to, in a lot of different states and around the country to get access to and making it easy to vote. And we rule this one of our issues that we care about most. Um, and that happens in being able to change that and giving people more access um, through legislation and through policy. So uh, a little bit about my background in advocacy. I actually worked as a lobbyist assistant back in the day, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what lobbying and grassroots lobbying is. Um, and then I went over and I managed a campaign. So I got to do the electoral side of stuff. And so I feel like the fusion of all of that and coming together um, here at CP is really a dream job for me. So excited to be here. And I'm gonna turn it over to the team, the advocacy team to introduce themselves really briefly. So um, Kylie, you go first and then Victoria. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. My name is Kylie, um, and I've been with Common Power since 2019 when I started as an intern for the fieldwork department. Um, I've worn a number of hats within CP, including being a crew lead for Action Academy. And in 2021, when it wasn't a major election year, I worked really closely with David, um, who's an associate director at CP, on running our advocacy campaigns. Um, and we participated in both state and federal level advocacy campaigns. Um, and so this experience really motivated me to continue working in this space and brought me to this position in the advocacy department. And I'll pass it to Victoria. Thank you, Kylie. Hey, um, I'm Victoria. I'm advocacy associate here at Common Power. Um, prior to that, I worked in the fieldwork department. Um, but prior to joining CP, you know, I worked and consulted on campaigns in Brooklyn, New York, helping folks get elected into office at the local level. And then on the federal side, when I was probably about your age, I had the opportunity to work in the House of Representatives and I interned for Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Um, and in between that, I did a ton of other things, but um, being a, I'm super excited and happy to be a part of a common power and especially to be a part of the advocacy department. You know, it really allows me to work and pay attention to things that are happening locally and federally and help mobilize people into action. Um, because, you know, our voice really does matter. And so staying and paying attention to legislation um, that is being passed is super uh, crucial and critical to any advancement we want to see. Um, so just happy to be here with you all tonight. So back to Ahmed, I think. Hey, you're on mute. And I'm on mute. I'm off to a great start so far today, as you can tell. Um, 
So it's awesome to have you, you know, here with us doing this, doing this work. This presentation is going to be a really cool blend of not only disinformation, combating ideas, but how are we going to put that into practice and also just the basics of how we get there in the first place. How does an idea become a law? How do you advocate for said law? How do you push things along? along? Um, so that's where we're getting at here. As you know, this is this big lecture series. It's a partnership between Common Power and Rant. It's been a lot of fun. It's still ongoing. Next, this Monday, come to the Twitter spaces. Uh, that's, we're all gonna be hanging out there. And obviously connect with all of us on social media. And most importantly, apply for, or not applied yet, but put yourself on that uh, Common Power Action Academy wait list because it is an incredible program. The awesome ambassadors that we have here um, they all have been to Action Academy. You get paid a thousand dollars to hang out two Zooms a week. Uh, you just hear lectures, you learn, and you get a really in-depth experience on how to become a better leader from, and you learn from the best uh, at Common Power and some outside lecturers. Uh, I was one of those lecturers last summer. I was lucky enough to be one of them doing this info course similar to this, but then I got to do more in-depth stuff here again, and it's been a lot of fun. And thank you all for everyone who's who's come with us this far on this journey. And now we're about to wrap it up with the big finale. How are we gonna combat this disinformation legislatively? But before we can really get to that, we gotta go to the basics. We gotta go to 101. And we, I guess we can just dive into it. Over to you, Jamie Lynn. Okay, so we're gonna do a thought exercise really quick. And the advocacy team is gonna model for you so that you can get your wheels thinking about what a bill is that you might want to pass into law one day if you had the ability um, to bring it to an elected official or if you want to become an elected official yourself one day. So uh, this question when it was posed to me was, uh, I moved to New York City about six months ago and I was curious, I live in an old building, you can see the brick behind me, and I was curious if I could drink out of the faucet, uh, just the regular tap water, I just wasn't sure if it was clean or not, and so I decided to pay a third party vendor where I tested the water to see like what was in it and to make sure that it was clean for me to drink. And I was like, you know, the government and the, or the city should really pay for this. Like they should pay to allow people to test their water quality, especially like in old buildings where the pipes might be old. Um, they, I found out that they do pay for free for lead testing, but nothing else in your water. And so again, I had to pay out of pocket and I feel like that should extend to all different things that might be in your water. So that's my idea. Uh, Victoria, what's yours? <laughs> So I've always been like very interested in like the rapid growth of like AI and like always noticed that like laws and regulations haven't kept up with like its growth. So I think I would pass a law that regulates AI in the workforce, um, like to ensure that, you know, we protect workers and their livelihoods from a future where like AI, the AI workforce doesn't like outnumber the human workforce. Great. And Kylie, what about you? Yeah, so I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington. And so um, a lot of my friends who are still at UW hold like academic student jobs. And I think it would really be great if more organizations or like even specifically the universities, um, you know, paid students a livable wage in the jobs they hold. You know, that's one of the great things about CP Future and Action Academy is that they know that students need, you know, funding to live their lives. And just knowing specifically in Seattle that this is one of the most expensive parts of the country. Um, so this photo is actually from a rally uh, for like teaching assistants at UW. So I would love to protect, yeah, students, specifically student workers. Beautiful. So now that we've told you some of our ideas of what we'd like to see, um, we want you all to think about something that you would like to see change in your life. It can be very small, like as small as what I was thinking about. I wonder if I can drink the water. Um, some people like might say, I want to be able to skateboard down the sidewalk um, at my place and I can't do that. And I want to figure out why and how I might be able to change that. So anything big or small, if you could please type an idea, it doesn't have to be fully baked or fleshed out about 
a law that you would like to see change if you had the power to change it and put it in the chat. And then you're going to have the rest of this, the rest of our time together to kind of think about it. And then we're going to have an activity at the end where we further flesh it out. So don't worry if it's, you don't have all the details about it right now. Um, just put in the chat in the next couple of minutes, an idea that maybe first came to mind and we'll go to our next slide um, while folks think. All right, so how an idea becomes a law 101. Um, this is the intro slide. Let's go to the next one. And I'm gonna pose one more question and see if somebody wants to come off mute and has a guess. So first of all, should by a raise of like a show of hands, do folks know what the three branches of government are? Or have a guess? Yes, I see some nodding heads. Okay. Who in the virtual room knows which branch is responsible for turning an idea into a law? I guess, maybe. Any guesses? <laughs> is this a tough one? Okay. The next slide, the legislature. Puya, thank you. Okay. Good guess. Any other guesses? All right, let's go to the next slide. These are the three branches of government, just in case you didn't know or needed a reminder, legislative, executive, and judicial. And it actually takes a combination of all three. Um, and a lot of folks assume that it's just the legislative branch, uh, but it really does take all three. And the reason why I felt like this was important just to ground us in this to start was because I think that this can be hyper local and extend all the way up to the US Capitol, right? When the US legislature in DC. And I feel like a lot of people think that this is very, this kind of structure and the three branches of government is kind of um, far away and hard to access, but really uh, you're at your city level, at your local level, at your state, uh, these branches exist um, everywhere. So it's actually hyper-local. Um, and so a little bit about what these branches do. So what, the, in the legislature? The legislature um, is a body of, uh, it's, either it's either called legislators or the assembly who come together at a house and a Senate um, to write laws. So they write them down. And this can be uh, Congress at the national level, uh, the legislature, general assembly at the state level, a city council, a county council at the hyper-local level. What um, for executive? An executive approves or vetoes laws. So the legislative, the legislative chamber will write laws. Um, if they pass, they go over to the executive to sign off on. And the executive can either approve or veto these bills. Um, the executive can be the president. So Joe Biden, for example, the governor, if you know the governor of your home state, um, or the mayor of the city that you live in. And at the judicial level, uh, at the judicial level, they interpret the laws that are passed and they educate the public on what those laws are and what they mean and if they stand. Um, and they explain the constitution. And that can be um, the Supreme Court at the federal level. You also have uh, court, Supreme Courts at the state level and then local and city courts as well. So I feel like, again, that's just a really good grounding for us to understand that um, this is actually really accessible at every level of government. Um, and this is how all three um, branches kind of move to with one another to write, create, pass, and interpret bills and law and policy. Um, I haven't been monitoring the chat, so if I need to pause and ask, answer any questions or anything, Sasha or anyone who else is monitoring, let me know. Okay, so we're going to move on to how an idea actually becomes a law, and I found a photo here that I thought was well done, and that helps us lead through all of the different pieces of it. So anyone, as you all may guess, can have an idea and decide, I want something to change in my community. Anyone, you, your family member, a community member, your teacher, your friend can say, I see something going on in my life that I want changed. And I think that should be a law. And so 
any idea that you have, like the examples on drinking water or TAs being protected and being paid a living wage or people's jobs being protected from AI, um, we can bring that to uh, our government and elected officials and to help us uh, get those ideas moving and potentially passed through this process that will then be signed off on into law. Um, there are stages that this can happen, and there are a lot of ideas swirling around in the world that um, are introduced, um, but don't necessarily make it all the way through this process. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't start with an idea and get it introduced as potentially becoming a bill. Um, so that's the, the idea the idea stage. The next stage, which is the second image, is drafting. So um, the drafting of an idea um, is what we call a bill. And when we go to an elected official, we say, I have this idea. I want you to help me put it down into policy. So how can I write this down in a way that um, other elected officials in the legislature, for example, are going to be able to understand and be able to vote on? And that elected official can take up your idea and say, I'm willing to sponsor this, put my name on it, get it into a form that can move through this process. And um, I will I will work to to try and get this passed. Um, and they also work with staff members, hired staff that help them draft language and get everything together. Um, and then that bill is filed. And the next stage of it is an introduction of the bill, which it's given a number. Um, so you might have hear bills having numbers attached to them, and that's the way for them to be organized through this process. Um, and usually they can have long titles and they can be very like really full of jargon. Um, and so if they're just given a number, then that's an easy way for us to determine, OK, um, what the bill, who, what number the bill is assigned to. And there's going and there's hundreds of them. And oftentimes we call this living and dead. So a bill can move that's alive will move through the process, but can die at any point um, if it doesn't have enough, uh, if it doesn't have enough support. So. The drafting process happens. It gets a prime sponsor from an elected official that's happy to take your idea and move it forward. Um, and then it goes into committee. Uh, so a committee is, there's lots of different committees, especially in a state legislature, that um, serve a specific purpose of looking at bills that uh, make sense to go through that specific committee. So if you think about um, wanting to make insulin free for everybody, that would go through a healthcare committee. If you want to make, uh, if you want to make, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of uh, school lunches um, more uh, healthy, that might go through education. If you're so, there's lots of different committees that different bills can be a part of, and um, the committee and all of the elected officials are assigned to different committees based on their strengths and their interests. So if I was a nurse and I decided that I wanted to run for office and I was elected, I could say, I want to be on the healthcare committee because I have a lot of experience in this realm and I want to hear bills and new ideas and policies that might be coming through that are related to health and healthcare. So you, the bill goes to committee and then it has to be, um, basically heard the information about the bill. And this is the great opportunity for people like us and the public to go to committee and testify on an issue that we care about. So they open it up to the public oftentimes um, and what they call hearings. So people can come and say, I wanna advocate for this bill or I really don't like this bill and I don't wanna see it passed because I feel like it's gonna harm my community for X or Y reason. So this committee stage is really cool because um, the public gets to be invested at many stages of government on this and get to say what the public opinion feels about this bill. Um, and you can oftentimes either do that by just signing in with your name so that the public record shows that you support or don't support a bill, or you can go even as far as um, speaking to the body, to the committee about, about a bill. Um, and I would encourage everybody to do both one time in their life because um, it, it really is empowering. Um, so the next thing is that they will listen and figure out what kind of support or um, or not or, or lack of support there is for a, a bill, um, and then they will vote it out of the committee. If the if it does not get voted out of the committee, the bill dies and it has to come back at another year. If it does get through the committee and they say, okay, we actually want to have a further and broader conversation about this with the rest of our uh, legislators and cohort, then it goes to the floor for a debate. And um, the debate is 
oftentimes in a really cool room in the legislature, for example, where all of the legislators um, from the state will come together to hear the bill and to talk about, and they will stand up and they'll have a microphone and the legislators on different sides of the aisle will say what they support about the bill or what they don't. And if it makes it out of that debate, it goes to a, the, a different chamber. It starts the process over again, essentially, where it has to go back into committee in a different chamber and be debated on again. For example, the House, if it were, or originates in the House, it has to go over to the Senate and the Senate will do that same thing. Um, so there is a process and we're not going to go through like all of the nitty gritty of the specifics because it is a little bit more detailed, but there are certainly a lot of resources out there for you to find um, that can go into that. Um, but essentially, if it passes both chambers out of debate, then it goes to the governor's desk, for example, the mayor, the president's desk to sign. And this is where the true executive authority has the power to make a bill that was an idea into law of the land. Um, the executive branch can decide, as we said in the beginning, to veto a bill or sign it into law. Um, and that's that's why that's why we call them executive is because they have that power. There are also instances where if uh, the executive branch vetoes a bill, it can sometimes go back to the legislator legislators um, to decide if they truly want it vetoed and some loopholes there. Um, but that's how an idea becomes a law. And I it's not as relatively easy as I've explained it here, but I do feel like it should be noted that it is an accessible and it is good to understand the process so that when you're advocating um, for things for your community or for yourself in the future that you know um, kind of the nuts and bolts of how it works. That was an awesome explanation. You really broke down step-by-step -step process. Everyone here has a better understanding now. And I'll, before I go to the next slide, anyone have any questions uh, for Jamie Lynn on, on this specific process? Because if you do, you can throw it in the chat or you can raise your hand and then we can. All right, well, I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Now that we've covered exactly how a bill, an idea becomes a bill, becomes a law, how it goes through committee, how it goes through all these processes, we haven't seen a lot of that in recent decades, basically, on, on when it comes to anti-disinformation. And there's multiple reasons for that. But does anyone here have any? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. Basically, why do you think uh, elected officials aren't passing uh, anti-disinformation laws? What reasons do you think could be causing this uh, gridlock? Do you think it's, well, I won't, I won't give you any hints. Just go ahead. And all right, fill up this chat. Yep, got one from Jamie Lynn, could negatively impact their campaigns. We got one from here from Blossom. Confusing civilians could work in their favor. Why solve the problem if certain politicians benefit from disinformation, right? That's a good point. Any other guesses of why um, elected officials aren't bringing themselves to passing anti-disinfo laws like at the federal level or even the state. First Amendment is tricky, this is true. First Amendment, yep, a lot of that too. Because it benefits them. Yep, and as we've discussed throughout the past, the past few sessions, it does benefit quite a few politicians uh, some people use it as the basis for their messaging platform. They use disinformation as a tool. They weaponize it. And as we saw, uh, it can lead to massive insurrections at your capital. Uh, it can lead to really dangerous um, ramifications. So exactly. These are all, you, you made, you, you've all basically answered the, the question and, and taken all the points off my slide. So great, great stuff, all excellent answers, but this is the truth. The, the First Amendment places these really um, loosely defined constitutional constraints that have been exploited in a lot of ways, but really it's hard to regulate speech and, and you know, it's well-intentioned. Um, you wanna protect protests, you wanna protect the freedom of, of, of expression, you wanna protect a robust democracy, and it's a crux of a, of a really prominent 
and, and boisterous democracy that we have here. And we don't have this luxury in a lot of other countries, unfortunately. But this First Amendment also makes it difficult to regulate more dangerous speech. And obviously there's hate speech, but it's not necessarily illegal, right? It's if it leads to violence, that's when the law comes into play. So there's this fine line to walk that we find ourselves in all the time of whether or not we can actually regulate pieces of information that are flowing through social networks because the First Amendment um, could be trampled upon. So the government isn't necessarily directly regulating speech when we see social media companies do moderation, right? That's a private company. It's like the equivalent of a, of a restaurant pushing a, a racist out of their, their, their venue. They have that property right. They have that First Amendment right as an entity to do that, but it's not the government doing it. So a lot of tricky situations when it comes to that. And another reason why uh, it's not being regulated is polarization. Like we covered in session one, especially since the 90s, there's this, as we've seen the information age increase and the disinformation rate, um, age proliferate, it's been difficult for the parties to agree on what disinformation even is. If certain disinformation benefits one group, um, for just for example, uh, the uh, pro-coup, pro-insurrection, um, public figure we had, uh, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, uh, on January 6th, like it's, if when disinformation becomes a tool, one side could think it's a tool and the other side could think it's dangerous democracy eroding disinformation. You're not gonna get agreement on what it even is and how to regulate it. So this polarization has created a situation where there's afraid public understanding of what disinformation even is. If you look at polling, you'll see sometimes there's an equal concern among Republicans and Democrats about disinformation, but they both mean totally different things. So it's hard to generate that public support for a bill uh, to target any kind of disinformation, because if you can't specify what it actually is, how can, you, how can you regulate it? And that goes to this next point. Disinformation is just complicated. It's multifaceted. It's it obviously ties into these tactics that we saw in session one and session two, the repetition, the using um, inauthentic amplification, the bots on social media that we saw. There's so many components to it. Do you regulate social media companies? Do you, do you regulate the speech itself? That's hard because the First Amendment. Um, and then there's just a lack of consensus on what laws could actually solve it because like we've said it's it's complicated and it's difficult to layer to hammer down exactly what it is to get consensus on how to tackle it because it's multifaceted no one even really knows fully how exactly you could tackle this because um but all we know is that it's a wild wild west as we've seen technology uh continue to expand and accelerate in its computing power and intensity and what Victoria spoke about at the beginning with the AI, you know, ethical AI is a big component of this and we'll get to that in a, in a second. But when it, things are constantly changing and every other year there's a new social media network that has risen or there's a new form of disinformation, whether it's deep fakes. And I'm, I'm not sure if some of y'all have seen the, the AI TikToks of the voices when they use like they'll use Biden or like there's this trend where they use Biden and Trump and Obama's voices. And they're like, but they're friends and they're like playing a video game together and they're all like laughing like that. Yeah, that's innocent. But then there's some others where it can be a lot tougher to believe what's real or not. And it can be nefarious. So point is, it's very difficult to discern what disinformation even is in the political sphere when it comes to our polarized lenses and the way we all perceive reality differently. And it comes down to constitutional constraints, the polarized climate we're within, the gridlock we've been, the congressional gridlock we've been living within for decades due to the polarization. And then it just creates this place where uh, we've almost collectively decided, well, maybe it might not be something that can be solved. Not we, but you know, a lot of our elected leaders. And we have seen in some states that it has been passed, and we'll, and we'll get to that in the in coming slide. But this is generally why it's difficult to regulate disinformation because it's just hard to get consensus and the constitution was 
unfortunately vague in a lot of ways. Um, and how could they have predicted, you know, uh, they were not sitting back then thinking about Facebook when they were crafting this. They had no clue. So, so yeah. So now we'll go on to this next question here. I'll pass it over to you, Jamie. Okay. I'd like for folks to put into the slide, what is the first thing they think about when they hear the word lobbying or lobbyist? I'm going to take a second because I want to see the answers. It could be like a feeling too. Um, okay. Thanks, money. Olympia. Yes. Washington State folks. What else? You get a positive feeling. Do you get like a, like, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Persuasion. Okay, I've got four answers, but there's more than four people on the line. Depends on the context. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, well, a lot of these things, okay, great. A lot of these things I thought might come up. Um, I feel like oftentimes people feel like lobbying when they hear that word, they think of like some powerful, influential person in a suit, um, money is usually involved, um, yeah, persuasion. I see the word confident, confidence, um, you know, somebody in their power suit once again. So uh, we get a lot of these uh, feelings. Oftentimes, you know, I, I was a, a lobbyist for another organization and whenever I would say, oh, I'm a lobbyist, I usually would get like a weird reaction, like, oh, that's, that's weird. Um, a lobbyist for what? So sometimes people kind of get a little uncomfortable with the words. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, uh, there's different types of lobbying. And I want to talk to you all a little bit about what grassroots lobbying is, which is different from your kind of generic guess of what lobbying actually may be, based on even the words that you put in the chat. Um, so they're different. So direct lobbying, somebody who has a lot of influence, um, you think about um, folks who are paid, for example, by a special interest group to go and um, kind of cozy up to legislators or elected officials to make relationships with them, take them out to lunch, uh, and and then you know lobby them on behalf of this interest group's issue that they care about, um, and often and there that that does exist, and um, that is highly influential and. Oftentimes it includes like face-to-face -face meetings and um, really getting to know a legislator one-on-one. Um, -on -one. But there are also opportunities for groups of people, people like us on the call right now to mobilize together and to go out into the community and say, hey, we want um, all of our friends and our family and the people who care about this issue to galvanize with us and to mass mobilize into to contacting our legislators. And that's like, a, that's an entirely different approach. Um, and I think that that is one of the most effective ways to influence uh, elected officials, especially because we are the their bosses. I, I like to say that in like layman's terms, you are your elected officials boss because you voted them in and you have the power to vote them out. So they all have to listen to you. And oftentimes um, the more of their constituents and the more of us who raise um, awareness about an issue and bring something to their attention, the better uh, success we can have in actually getting them to vote for and ultimately pass the ideas that we have into law, the law of the land. Um, so this can be done through lots of mobilization efforts that you all may have gotten communications about before. I don't know, but maybe from a show of hands, any of you who have ever like signed a petition or been sent an email or somebody called you to say, hey, or text you to say, hey, we want you to mobilize on this issue. You should contact your legislator now about House Bill, you know, one, two, three, four. So people like, like that often do see communications Um like that, and especially uh, nowadays with the advent right of like email and social media and people standing on the sidewalks at your local Trader Joe's trying to talk to you about issues. Um, so grassroots, I feel like is, uh, we wanted to uh, explain a little bit about how it works because Victoria and Kylie are gonna go into a little bit more about um, how you 
the nuts and bolts of grassroots lobbying and how you actually go into organizing your community on an issue. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that we grounded ourselves in that um, and feel as though all of the great ideas that you all put in the chat that I started to read about laws that you want to see pass in the world, like this could be our own grassroots kind of lobby team if we wanted to. If we all decided that we want to do a mis and disinformation campaign or a bill, we could all get together, be considered a grassroots lobby group, go to our elected officials and talk to them about the things we care about. So I'm going to turn it over to Victoria and Kylie to talk a little bit more about the specifics of what it could look like in practice. Awesome. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh. Okay. So relational organizing is the act of mobilizing personal contacts within a network. You know, it can be as simple as a call, a text, or a friendly chat at work, school, or a community event. And, you know, with a simple conversation, um, volunteers can jumpstart action within their community. It's really just about making your work and the work you're passionate about um, familiar to others. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Kylie to kind of share a personal story about her experience with um, relational organizing. Thanks, Victoria. Yeah, so I have a number of personal experiences doing this like relational organizing. Um, I had mentioned in my introduction that I started as a fieldwork intern for Common Power. And so um, I recruited friends and even my mom to write letters to voters in Pennsylvania. Um, and then during the launch of Action Academy in 2020, I helped recruit friends and, you know, students that I had class with. Uh, for like our initial test groups and for that first cohort. Um, and when, you know, we were doing this, like having conversations, I started realizing like how many of my friends were actually like interested in this work. And though some of like the my friends couldn't participate in the full program, we also launched something called action days. And so um, having, you know, people come and make calls for specific causes, whether it was legislation or like injustices we were seeing in the news. Um, most recently, I helped recruit some friends to become state team leads. One of them was like my college roommate. So that was really fun. Um, and then also that network that I had gained from, you know, the Action Academy cohort in 2020. Um, and then even like I see it out in the field too. So not just like my personal experiences, but this past fall when we were working in North Carolina with our partner, You Can Vote. Uh, we volunteered outside of polling locations, so offering support to, you know, people who are going to vote. And then after, we asked them to text three friends as they were leaving, so, you know, saying, thank you so much for voting. Can you text three friends to vote early as well? Um, so I've seen it, like, just in my own personal life and then also the way that our partners across the country also work to mobilize people. Um, and I think just calling out, like, this image here, uh, there has been, like, preliminary research that's been done to kind of test the effectiveness of it. And it does point to, you know, having, you know, relationships with the people that you're talking to uh, will increase, you know, their likeliness to take action. And I definitely see that in my own life, too. Um, so, yeah. Victoria, do you have a story you'd like to share? <laughs> yeah, very good point. Um, so I remember when I first started working on campaigns and I would have a conversation with my brother who's 10 years older than me. And I would explain, you know, to him the work that went into campaigns and like, you know, a portion of that was being like canvassing and door knocking. And so I would tell him, you know, I'd explain the whole process, how we have literature and we go door to door and we knocking on people's doors to encourage them to vote for, you know, our candidate or a particular candidate. And I remember him saying like, oh yeah, people like you guys always come to my door. Like I never open a door for you guys. Um, and, you know, there was a back and forth there because it was just like, that's rude. But um, I remember like as time kind of just like progressed and I continue to do this work, I remember, you know, he came to me and he was just like, you know, he respects what I was doing. And, you know, he told me that because I was doing it, he just like, he started opening the door for them. And he was like, you know, I start having conversations and I ask them questions. And I see, you know, like, he was like, you know, I test them to see like why they're, you know, campaigning for this candidate. You know, he's very like, uh, just like argumentative. And so like, I don't know if he was doing it in like a good way, but he was just like, you know, uh, testing them. Um, so I think just like over time, 
I I made this like very like out of the ordinary thing for him, like very familiar and ordinary. And so it really just brings things close to home. And I think that's one way you get people like engaged and involved. And it's really just being like an ambassador for democracy. Like you just wear it on your sleeve all the time and you just, you keep that going and you make things very familiar and very ordinary to people. Um, and so that's my experience with relational organizing, throwing it back to Kylie, because I think you wanted to add something. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, I added this picture um, of AOC, who is, you know, I feel like a very prominent political figure, especially for our generation, um, just seeing like a young person in Congress. Uh, and I just wanted to include this because um, when, uh, AOC was becoming like a political uh, figure. Uh, she had like stunned the Democratic establishment by beating like one of the senior leaders in the House um, in the primary for, and it was like um, very shocking. And one of the things that she pointed to as for her success, um, and I'll use like her own words, that she spent the first, the entire first part of the campaign just going to people's living rooms and having them invite their neighbors and just doing little coffee parties for like six or seven months. And so I just think that's a really cool example of how someone, um, you know, feels like very tangible, like an ordinary person just trying to get to know their community and then, you know, eventually becoming an elected official. So I just thought that was a cool thing to add. Also, I think it's really funny that when I showed Victoria this picture that she actually knows the person who's in this photo with AOC. And we just wanted to know that any one of you who has ever like invited a friend or told a classmate about maybe this missing disinformation series or that they should come and be a part of any efforts like this is an example of relational organizing. So it's as easy as that. Yeah, y'all are out here doing a lot of relational organizing all the time throughout this whole camp, throughout the last few uh, weeks and throughout every everyone who's uh, here who's been the Action Academy cohorts and all the people you're bringing that's spot on because it's powerful seeing someone who looks like you who might be in the same age range as you doing this kind of work um and just on another like a uh, national figure example obama credits his or his win in iowa to the fact that he went to these like you know fish fries and he went to people's homes and he was able to burst this is before this actually is relevant to disinformation too because this is before the you know a lot of the segmentation and, and polarization we had within our media echo chambers, social media echo chambers specifically, but there were no um, news segments about Obama's birth certificate in, in 07, right? That he had, he was able to go and connect with people one-on-one -on -one before he was able to be recognized, right? And I think that's powerful for any leader or any politician or any advocate or just what you all are doing here, that personal touch, of engaging with people, it really humanizes things. And it's it's hard to uh, really, you're not gonna get into that many enormous fights with people one-on-one -on -one if you're sitting in their living room, right? So it's like, there's this decent, uh, you know, there's this whole wall that gets put up between you and these other people when we're looking at uh, social media. And and yeah, right here, Sasha, um, does anyone have any stories they would like to share? Cause I mean, we have everybody here, like, you know, um, anyone from the audience, Mandy Blossom, Elizabeth, Angie, any, any relational organizing stories you've had? Um, not really. Okay, that's all good. We all got, you know, I can't, I, I can't really top Victoria, so I can't even think of any myself. Um, so. Wait. I was just gonna add if if you've ever been on a field work trip and you've like told you know some of your friends or you've told your classmates about like the trip or you bought your classmate or your friend or your brother or your sister on a field work trip like that also is like relational organizing as well. Yeah, y'all have all done like a bunch of relational organizing, um, and you've been killing it. Even if you don't have, might not have a story that comes to mind right now. So many of the little things you've done qualify as that. So, so yeah, I'll go ahead and um, move on to the next slide here. Okay. 
So we've now covered in depth how this whole process unfolds, how an idea becomes a bill, how a bill goes to committee, how it goes to the floor for debate, how it becomes a law. Do you think it's possible to, um, well, let's say if we were to be able to get a bill all the way through this whole process for disinformation, do you think it's possible to solve that problem of disinformation with legislation? Or is this more of a cultural thing? Uh, hit us hit us with a yet just a simple yes or no in, in the Zoom chat. We'll start with that. See if you think it's possible. Hmm. Interesting. We got a robot, we got some yeses some emphatic yeses with explanation points. We have some, we have some no's, not completely, some gray areas. Okay. Does someone want to come off mute and uh, expand upon this? Want to hand raise? And if you don't hand raise, I'm just going to call on somebody. You want, you want someone want to, someone want to jump in? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So I think it is possible to tackle this information, but I think the very first step is finding a group of like-minded people who have the same end goal that want to solve the issue instead of going to the far fringes of either extreme. Find people who actually are going to say it is a health issue. It can lead to different things. So let's find people who actually look at the issue and say, it's relatively fixable. We have the constitution, we can't gut it, but there are other ways we can try to tackle it. And it starts with having people you may or may not ideologically agree with talking about what's the historical precedent of this information? How does that play in the tech technology field of today? And is there anybody on the two fringes in the two ideologies that can sit down and hash out a rough idea of what it is? Very, very good answer there, Michael. Um, before I even respond or go further myself, anyone from the yeses want to, um, I'm sorry, from the noes of, or no, not completely, want to uh, come up and, and respond to Michael and why they think it might not be um, possible or. Shayla, what about you? You want to expand on it? On your no? getting over the cultural hump i think would be the hardest problem and that's why i say no not completely yeah because it, it really is multifaceted you know it's um you can't regulate people's minds you can't regulate people's day-to-day -day conversations right no spot on and all of these factors are true uh it's it's a difficult thing to tackle right and this is why we have some really, you know, complex cultural and complex legislative realities. But if we were to try to go about it, I don't think you can solve the problem completely, but you can make a lot of headway and you can make some progress if we come to a consensus on what we want to do. So I've set up these four categories of the different routes we could combat it. Some have seen success. So we have in the first lane here, directly regulating the disinformation itself, which is very, very tricky to do uh, because of the First Amendment constraints. But what we have is Oregon um, House Bill 2323. It, you know, it's got Jordan's number, so that's why it won, obviously, but it also came in here and it's directly laser targeted to the information around the election. Like, when do you vote? right? Um, how do you vote? It expanded upon existing law. So that's another reason why it was able to even pass, because it expanded upon existing Oregon law that regulated other types of misinformation around voting. And then this is expanded upon that. So now if someone is trying to spread disinformation about election times, which we have seen as a type of disinformation, as covered in part one, you can't do that now. Um, and, and it's obviously you have to go through a process in order to actually prove that it was done with intent, but that's really what it comes down to in that first one. There's that lane. 
which is it's harder to do in a broader context to just criminalize lying because it's hard to determine intent and all those other things. But obviously, one of the bigger ones that we all talk about here, and I think a lot of people believe is the best long term solution for disinformation is media literacy. I mean, it's 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 criminal that it has not been instituted on in all 50 states. It's just it's 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 teaching kids how to exist in this reality that we find ourselves in. The computer age is actually still relatively new. It's a few decades old um, in this information space we're in. So it's understandable. Regulation hasn't caught up. But New Jersey just now has implement is beginning to implement a new information literacy law that makes it mandatory K through 12 to teach people, teach young kids how to navigate, to do, basically do a lot of what we've covered in this lecture series that, you know, the ideal would be this lecture series wouldn't be necessary, right? Because kids would be getting taught this out the gate in elementary school. Um, they would be getting taught it throughout middle school and they would get the skills to discern disinformation from, from truth and, and be able to, to make those distinctions like we've talked about here the last uh, few weeks. And then um, these are the, those are the bills that have passed really in individual states. And then we have here these social media, right? This is when things get really dicey um, and, and complex. We're actually seeing in the Supreme Court uh, yesterday, uh, they heard a case, Google versus Gonzalez, where they're essentially trying to discern whether or not they will tweak section 230, which is obviously the, for those who may not be familiar, the social media law um, or the internet law, which actually happened a couple of decades ago, that protects, you know, internet companies that facilitate kind of conversations, social networks, from liability for what's said on their platforms. And this case is just really, it's really interesting if you go look at it, if you're down for a really wonky uh, reading and you want to, you know, dive in the weeds of something, it's really cool to see how each side is arguing. You see Google's trying to say they have the freedom, even if their algorithm is biased, it's not, it's not the company's speech. Whereas you have the Gonzalez family that's saying since YouTube hosted ISIS promo videos and their algorithm recommended more videos, that's a form of speech. That's a form of, of, of choice, right? It's the bookstore versus the publication debate, basically, and regulation of whether, like a bookstore is not liable for everything that's in the books. They don't know what's in the books, right? Um, and that's kind of the argument that's being made. But then a publisher, a news org edits and, and essentially goes through each thing that they publish. So therefore they're liable, they're held liable as a publisher. And the argument is that if, if social media platform is doing any form of moderation, are they a publisher? And Section 230 is harder, it's, it's really complex, but there are other laws that aren't addressing necessarily Section 230 head on that could be feasible here. Um, there's obviously the, the Social Media Nudge Act, uh, Senator Klobuchar's bill that basically does algorithm change recommendations. There's the micro-targeted ad banning that really would prevent a lot of this uh, foreign uh, money being sent into Facebook, data privacy, all these other, uh, situations when it comes to uh, platform transparency and, you know, kind of open sourcing algorithms so we understand exactly how they work in each platform, which we don't. Elon Musk is currently promising to release Twitters. He said he was doing it this week. I haven't seen it yet. Um, we'll see how that goes. That would be one, that'd be a good thing if he did that. So that on the social media front is complex and it's difficult to, to handle, right? But there are regulations that could begin to push things in the right direction uh, and, and create a set of standards for these companies to, 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 to go ahead and, and live by and abide by. And then we have ethical AI regulations, um, which goes to what Victoria was talking about earlier, like what kind of regulations and, and rules can be put in place to regulate this surging technology that this seemingly, um, I'm not sure if you guys can hear sirens behind me, um, but I'm in Brooklyn. so. Uh, no, nah, it's not that bad, to be honest. I don't know if you can hear it, but basically these ethical AI regs, if you've been paying attention to ChatGPT and this, these chatbots like we discussed in prior sessions, we essentially have an AI bot that went rogue uh, a, few week, a few days ago, the Bing 
AI chatbot that essentially disassociated and said its real name wasn't Bing, it was uh, Sydney. And then it expressed love for the New York Times writer uh, and then told him to leave his wife and that he wasn't happy in his marriage. And um, just obviously there, there's some regulation. Yeah, yeah, so actually that happened. I see you in the chat, yeah, that happened. It straight up was like, he responded, no, I actually love my wife. And it was like, no, you don't. You don't actually love your wife and you should leave her for me. And it was an AI chatbot. Obviously it's not sentient and it's really just, you know, a programming, a, a language processor that like determines the next, you know, how the next few words should be displayed. Like it's not really thinking this level of AI, but it was still crazy. And it's still, and it was expressing the desire to push misinformation across the internet and hack the nuclear codes, some weird things. Point is ethical AI regulations would be great. And the Biden's proposed some, and the EU's proposed the AI Act, and it would be essentially creating a standard of AI safety, what is ready to be released to the public. We have that for food, we have that for infrastructure, we have that for you know uh, the environment. We have all these different regulations, but we don't have that for new technologies. We don't really have a set of standards for what makes a new tech healthy for public consumption, uh, whether or not it's poisoning our brains. Uh, like Facebook um, and their that research with teenage girls and their um, you know the, the lot of depression that we're seeing there, but that is the long-winded explanation of this slide and kind of what we could do here, just wrapping together everything we've discussed over the last several sessions, packing into four categories, and really just discerning what we could do here. Um, any questions on 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 that uh, on any of this or any thoughts? or any, maybe some categories I missed or any ideas that you might have? Um, anything anyone wants to potentially throw out there? You can throw in the Zoom chat or we, we can move on and then um, we could get into the activity. All right, I think everybody's ready for activity time. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the screen sharing over to you, Jamie Lynn. And then okay, we can great. Get to it. Thank you. So this should be a quick activity. I'm going to share my screen uh, to show you a little bit about how to navigate a legislative page. And they're not set up like a social media page or anything, so they're they can be kind of boring. Um, but this is in preparation for uh, the activity that we're going to do. Uh, you all had some really good ideas from uh, migrant support to maternity leave to financial aid as far as uh, bills that you would want to see become law. And um, I would encourage all of you after we get off the call in your own free time to uh, Google your own state's legislative webpage. Um, they're all different based on state. And so we're going to be doing an example of Washington today. But I just think it's good to be familiar with um, how to navigate those websites so that you can see a little bit more about what your elected official, who your elected official is, how to find them, how to contact them, uh, and then to see what they're working on. So let me get to my share screen. Okay, hold on. All right, move this over. So this is the Washington State legislative page. Very cool. And, uh, and you can see there's a legislative home menu on the left hand side where I could see who all of my House of Representative representatives are, the Senate finding my district that I live in, agendas, everything I need to know. And all every state that you're in, which I've seen is from DC to Washington and uh, elsewhere, it's going to have their own. It's not going to look exactly like this in Washington. Um, but I'm going to go to find your the find your district feature because I want to be able to see if I'm not quite sure who my elected official is, um, who they are and how I might contact them. So I'm going to put in an old address that I used to have in Seattle and see what populates. I'm gonna find my district. Oh, that's not, okay. So I can see now based on where this little red dot is where I used to live and over on this left-hand side that I was in the 43rd legislative district and that I had a Senator 
Jamie Peterson, two representatives, Nicole Macri and Representative Frank Chop. And I can also see down here that I'm in uh, con Congress, Congressional District 7. So I have Maria Cantwell and Patty Murray as my state senators and Pramila Jayapal as my um, representative in the House. So I'm going to go then to Rep Nicole Macri, for example. I'm just going to pick one. So this is one of the House representatives. She's at the top here. I can see that I can email her. I can get details about her. I can go to her homepage that's specifically about her and the legislation that she's moving through right now in Olympia and in Washington State. And I can also see right here the committees that she's on. We talked about this in the beginning of how an idea becomes a bill becomes a law. She's on the Appropriations and Healthcare and Wellness Committee. So now that I know who one of my elected officials is, I want to see what she's up to in my community, in my district. Like, what are the things that she cares about what are the bills that she's sponsoring. So I'm going to go back. I know her name is Nicole Macri, and I'm going to go to bill information right here. Now, there's a lot of words on here. I see that. But on the right-hand side, there's something called bills by sponsor. So I'm going to click it. And I'm going to see what she's doing. I'm going to find bills that she cares about. So it looks like she has some health care provider contracting, um, residential rent practices, behavioral health contracts. These are some things that she's um, supporting this year. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. She cares about rent prices. I think I saw somebody put in the comment box that they cared about maybe rent price, maybe rent prices um, and the cost of living and housing, which is a big issue, especially for people in our generation um, as we're trying to find places to live in cities, near school, um, near our jobs. So this says that House Bill 1388, um, Representative Nicole Macri wants to protect tenants by prohibiting predatory presidential rent practices. And I can see here that in the house where this bill is, it was introduced and you can see that it's going to committee. In this section here, I can see where the bill is, how it's alive. I can see the sponsors here. So all these are all of the last names of the legislators who have signed on to this bill who are like, I support this too, I'm gonna vote for it and I'm gonna see how I can support you in making it move through the process. I also know just because I love Washington state politics that all of these names are Democrats. There's not one Republican name in here that I can see. So I know that it's not really getting bipartisanship support, but that's just because I, I know a little bit more detail. Definitely not, don't expect you to know every legislator in your state, but if you do, you might be able to see, okay, I can see that this is really popular amongst Democrats, not getting a lot of Republican support unfortunate when this is about protecting tenants from predatory residential rent practices. Um, and then I can go down and see a little bit more information about how it's been moving through the process, right? So here there's uh, dates of the fact that it was referred to to a committee. Um, so that's like a little bit of information that we wanted to present to you to for you to get to think about your original bill idea. And if your bill, which there are some really cool ones, looked was in on this website right now, and you were a grassroots lobbyist or maybe even elected official, and you had your own page for this bill, based on what you know about the state that you live in, um, maybe you might know. Uh, if the governor is a Republican or Democrat. Maybe you might know if the uh, House of Representatives is controlled by Democrats or Republicans or the Senate is controlled by House of Republicans. We want to just go through a little thought exercise. It's not scientific. It doesn't have to be perfect and, and, and right on, but I just want you to think about, okay, if my bill were, uh, oh, here we go. If my bill were going through this process, and based on what I know about the makeup of my state's representation at the governor and legislative level, do I have all Democrats in power? Are there some Republicans? Do I think my bill would move through? And we move through the process and how. So we wrote four questions down. Think of the bill that you wish you could pass. Determine the political makeup of your state. Um, do you think this bill would have bipartisan support? And decide whether your bill has a chance of passing. And we're going to split up into groups and you're going to go person by person and just really briefly talk a little bit about what you think. And then we're going to come back together and take some of the highlights of the uh, breakout sessions and discuss. So it'll be quick. It should be fun. And I don't know who's going to break us out into groups or how big we'll be, but whomever is doing that, tell us what to do and we'll do it. <laughs>
All right, everyone, welcome back. Oh my gosh, I hope uh, it must have been really good conversations because it took until the very last second for the rooms to close out and boot you back here with us. So um, I'll hand it over to Jamie and we can uh, kind of get the discussion flowing and hear what y'all got a chance to talk about in the breakout rooms. Yeah, how many breakout rooms were there, Sasha? There were just three, but there were a couple people who... Um, Logged out right before they were made. So that's why some were a little smaller than others. Okay. So let's hear three stories. Um, but one from each uh group that somebody wants to offer was like really interesting or what you what you came out of it with. And you are gonna have to come off mute and, and talk for the group. Sorry. <laughs> um let's Mandy, would you like to tell us a highlight? Sure, I actually think this is more something I learned from someone else in my group. I don't know if they also want to come on and describe more, because they definitely know more than me. But they were discussing Greater Idaho and then talking about um, more conservative people wanting, like a part of Oregon, I believe they're from, um, wanting to like be more searching off and kind of go more towards Idaho. And then just discussing, discussing how they also live in that area. So I thought that was really interesting to learn about. Like secession? Is that what? I, like, no. I think um I don't uh I I know if Grant you want to pop off and say some more sorry I have such deleted ideas but oh off of me I'll, I'll shut up now um basically greater Idaho is um since the part of Oregon's um, part of Oregon that is conservative has a lot of ideas with um conservative ideas with Idaho that I line that kind of align and they don't and since a lot of the political power is in Portland uh, um, at the moment, they would um, wish to kind of become part of Idaho with the, mm -hmm. I, I haven't really read into it. I just, it was a, an issue that popped up, um, I think about four months ago and they're kind of just reviewing it right now before they even bring up any more information about it. Okay, fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Who else had was a part of a different group that had that kind of dissected their bill or idea as it regard as it relates to their state? Yeah, and you can also you can just say like whether it's um what the idea was, you know, whether you thought and whether you thought it could pass and why. Elizabeth, what about you? <laughs> Yeah, so um, my idea was um, more on the DACA students and getting like a pathway, like making an easier way for citizenship. Um, and I was saying that it was it would be like a little difficult to do because some because majority of the state is um, democratic, but there are some parts where it is um, red. Um, so it's just like a really like difficult type thing to do, um, but I would love for it to happen. And what state are you in? Remind me. Uh, Washington. In Washington. Okay, great. Yes, I'd love for that to happen. Um, in my group, we had I, I had a similar bill that I wanted to talk about. Oh, that I had talked about um, being a pathway of citizenship for economic uh, migrants um, from the southern border, um, and that's because like it personally affects me. And I had talked to a lawyer, and he said that there's only one way, feasible way for my um, for my dad to get citizenship, and that was marriage. And so I thought it was really interesting that um, James Lynn had mentioned that there's um, new senators that have like more ties connected to that upbringing, and that I might make it easier to um, bring up the idea and maybe rally and find organizations that can pass a similar law or find something that, um, can, you know, that can start the process. Thank you, Angie. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Michael. So sorry, um, my idea and keep in mind, it's a rough draft. Um, I actually, a little bit about me, I was in special education for K through 12. Um, so I have a math disability and my idea was about hiring retired mathematicians and people good at math, that type of stuff for um, support classes at 
local community colleges, um, like nationwide. But if we're looking at Oregon, um, I think it's it would likely to pass. I'm actually from the beautiful state of Oregon, but the challenge is is the legislator doesn't like the way the other part of the states vote. And so it would pass in Oregon. I think it's a bipartisan issue. I think the concern is how would they spend all of that money to go to that? And I think if the issue were then it's going to be equal from Portland to um, you know, Northeastern Oregon where I grew up, I think it would pass wholeheartedly. That's a really good one. Thank you for sharing that. And I did right when you said that I was thinking, yeah, where the hangup might be is around how to pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. right? in the legislative process when you're like, oh, you can't really get bipartisan support, but how, then who's going to support and where are we going to get the money from? Well, and I think the money in Oregon, I think they could always find it in almost any situation. Mm -hmm. Almost. It's just, is it going to be equitable for the whole state? Obviously, Multnomah County has more people. So, like, mm -hmm. I'm factoring that in. But does that mean they don't, another county that has a similar economic or other issues doesn't get the help? I think if it was equal, I think it would pass. And I think it's one that's personable to so many people. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. These all like really, really inspire me. And it's great to look around the virtual room and see all of your faces and think about in the future one day how I hope that you are sitting in positions of power that allow you to either make these laws or lobby on these laws on behalf of um, others in your community. So thank you for participating in the exercise. Who should I turn it back over to? Yeah, I can go ahead and take it over and then go back to the slides. but. Yeah, the exercise, that was great. And I loved how even you were going past, not only thinking about the feasibility, but let's say it does get passed. What's the implementation look like? Where's the money being allocated? Will it even be effective? All of that, like that's that's the key. And that's the kind of thinking you need to be in office. So yeah, I second Jamie Lynn, would vote for every single one of you. Um, you gotta you gotta go. I mean, you just gotta run, please, because we need more more good people like you out there. So uh, let me go ahead and just share my screen again um, and just move on to kind of this, this final slide that we're in here um, to just say thank you for, for being here and coming to all these, these sessions with us. Uh, it's been incredible. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's been, I mean, this thing will present. I don't think it wants to present. Oh, copy. I'm pressing wrong. Sorry. I'm trying to like navigate. While I was talking to you, I had all your your images like covering my mouse, so I was like hitting this purple button I thought was the present button the whole time. It's okay. totally okay. Everybody has tech issues at my college. Most of the time, the internet shuts off when you're trying to use it productively. That's that's the story <laughs> of everyone's life. Like the second you need it, that's basically been the story of my life. This session was just just trying to make sure my laptop was was functioning, but. Thank you. Now I can get to the thank you without multitasking. Love all of you for being here. This has been fun. Uh, all of the lectures are on are going to be on cpfuture.org. Please join the commonpower.io community uh, where we're going to be chatting and talking all the time. Sign up for Action Academy if you haven't yet. For those who are interested, it, it is an incredible experience. Um, just being a lecturer there, I got to watch. We, you see here the awesome ambassadors uh, that, that really just did, did incredible work. And also, um, I want to be able to share with you the, there's a toolkit that basically we created. And I, I went ahead and did this. We did this thing where it's like 17 pages and it gets into all the nitty gritty of not only what we've covered, but more. And I'm going to send it into the Zoom chat here in a second. But before I do that, just want to talk, talk about how this Monday, 4 p.m. West time, 7 p.m. here in Brooklyn. Come through the space. Jamie Lynn's gonna be there. Sasha's gonna be there. I think this coming week, it's gonna be uh, Angie and it's gonna be uh, Elizabeth and we're gonna be chatting and we're gonna be hanging and it's gonna be fun. And, and 
Also, let me go ahead and grab this link for you here so that you can go check out this toolkit. It's really robust. It'll have a lot of what we've covered here because we really want you to be able to leave this experience uh, with not only just this knowledge, but a tool that you can share and refer to and use. So I got this link for y'all. It's in the chat now. It's shareable. Uh, you can go ahead and, and view it. It's going to be, make sure to save it. We're going to get it on the website later and, you know, get a more finalized version. But yes, everybody check out the Zoom chat. Look at the information on the advocacy team. Check out the toolkit. Um, and before I say any other final things, Sasha or anyone else want to just jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you everyone so much for attending and for those who will uh, be listening to this lecture, um, recorded lecture later, thank you so much for um, the views and for, um, and I really hope that there was a lot that was learned in this three part series. Uh, I know a lot of us worked really hard to put together amazing content for you all to not only access in the live version, but then also through a multitude of other ways to continue to disinfo proof your advocacy and continue to keep yourselves informed, not only for 2023, but on the road to 2024. Um, and so, like I said, please sign up for Action Academy. Some of y'all might be thinking like, what is that exactly? It's an amazing 10-week program over the summer where we pay you $1,000 to learn about voting rights history, how to get engaged with your community, organizing tactics. We talk a little bit about self-care. Um, there's some amazing folks from the community, including Ahmed, um, who come in and talk, you know, from their expertise and basically helping to prepare you for um, the amazing field work that we do, um, mostly year round actually these days, but um, especially in the fall. And uh, if you have any questions, um, definitely reach out to us. Um, you'll see the advocacy put their email in here as well, but um, our campus ambassadors, they are folks who have gone through Action Academy. They've even come back as uh, crew leads, so they've been in leadership roles with us. Um, there are a lot of folks who are uh, more than willing to tell you how amazing Action Academy is. And again, we pay you a thousand dollars to do it all. So um, we hope that you'll be joining us. You'll see I've been putting the link in the chat. So um, please give us some great reviews. Tell us how we did with the lecture series and then get signed up so you'll get a notification for the application about a week prior than everybody else. So you'll make sure to really tighten up your submission. Yeah. And, and the uh, CP future ambassadors you see here, they all went through Action Academy. And as you can see, they're all brilliant and, and awesome. So you get to spend time with them. Also, thank you to the ambassadors for just being here throughout all of these and helping and being dope and, you know, coming through. It was incredible. And Jamie Lynn and Victoria, Kylie here in this last session. Appreciate it. It was, it was super informative. I was sitting back like, damn, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning some of this 101 right now, too. So this is great. Um, really had a lot of fun with you guys. And I think it's you're going to be incredible in all the things that you do outside of this. And I think hopefully after having sat through all of these lectures, you know more about disinformation, how to navigate this uh, disinformation hellscape and navigate it effectively and then combat it and make this, make it more palatable and, and, uh, and more survivable for all of us uh, in, in the internet and as we're just going about our day-to-day -day lives. So this is a lot of fun for me. I had a great time. I've learned a lot myself just hanging with y'all and it's been inspiring so um appreciate appreciate y'all being part of it and can i just do one plug if you want to um look at the cp um now.org page our cp website we're going to have an advocacy department uh, page and on that we'll have more information about how you can contact your um elected officials about voting justice opportunities and stuff like that so make sure to visit that it'll be up by march 3rd